It was in my hometown of London, England, where we start this story. The date, February 13th, 1908. As the old saying would have us believe, all men are created equal. But in this time, women, even less so. But as a woman of character and standing once told us, justice and judgment lie often a world apart. Sometimes it's amazing to see just how far apart they really are. So the evidence has been heard. Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst, you are hereby found guilty by the court. You are to be charged with obstruction. You shall be passed to Holloway Prison to carry out your sentence for the period of six weeks. Bailiff, take the prisoner down. Active, determined and often willing to use force, militant. A person who believes in political or social changes and takes part in activities such as public protests or demonstration. Activist. Refusing to do what someone in authority tells you to do. Disobedience. To experience difficulty and make a very great effort in order to do or achieve something. Struggle. To admit, often unwillingly, that something is true. Concede. An occasion in which you win a game, competition, election or war. Victory. In the annals of history, there stand figures whose resolve and resilience echo through the corridors of time, and among them, Emmeline Pankhurst stands as a beacon of unwavering determination. With an unyielding spirit and a steadfast commitment to justice, Emmeline Pankhurst fearlessly challenged the status quo, defying social norms and confronting entrenched prejudices with unwavering courage. In the tumultuous landscape of the early 20th century, she emerged as a stalwart champion of women's suffrage, tirelessly advocating for the most fundamental of rights, the right to be heard. Her rallying cry reverberated across nations, igniting the flames of change and inspiring countless souls to stand shoulder to shoulder in the fight for equality. In the face of adversity and oppression, she stood undaunted a relentless force for progress in a world shrouded in darkness. Through her impassioned speeches and daring acts of civil disobedience, she shattered the chains of oppression and paved the way for the future generations to inherit a world where gender does not dictate their destiny. Today, as we reflect upon her legacy, let us draw strength from her unwavering resolve and unwavering belief in the power of individuals to effect change. Let us honour her memory by continuing the work that she began by championing the rights of all people and by striving tirelessly towards a future where justice reigns supreme and every voice is heard. And let us dare to dream of a future where equality is not just a distant ideal, but a living reality for all. And here we stand right now in the very room where it all began. This is the home of Emily Pankhurst here in Manchester. So stay with us as we delve into more of the history and the fundamentals behind this great lady. Emmeline Pankhurst was born on July 14th, 1858 in Manchester, England, born in the area of Mossside. Mossside is an inner city area of Manchester that is 1.9 miles to the south of the city centre. Mossside is bounded by Hume to the north, Chalton on Medlock, Rushholme and Fallowfield to the east, Wally Range to the south and Old Trafford to the west. With a family name of Golden, the eldest daughter of 10 children, she grew up in a politically active family. Her parents were both abolitionists and supporters of female suffrage. Gordon was 14 when her mother took her to her first women's suffrage meeting. However, 
Gordon chaffed at the fact that her parents prioritised the son's education and investment over hers. After studying in Paris, Gordon returned to Manchester where she met Dr Richard Pankhurst in 1878. Richard was a lawyer who supported a number of radical causes including women's suffrage. Though he was 24 years older than Gordon, the two married in December 1879 and Gordon became Emmeline Pankhurst. Over the next decade, she gave birth to her five children, daughters Christabel, Sylvia, Adela and sons Frank, who died in childhood, and Harry. We will elaborate on that a little bit later on. Despite her children and other household responsibilities, Pankhurst remained involved in politics, campaigning for her husband during his unsuccessful runs for Parliament and hosting political gatherings here in their home. In 1889, she became an early supporter of the Women's Franchise League, which wanted to enfranchise all women, married and unmarried alike. At the time, some groups only sought the vote for single women and widows. Her husband encouraged Pankhurst in these endeavours until his death in 1898. Coping with such strange circumstances and grief consumed much of Pankhurst's attention over the next several years. However, she retained a passion for women's rights and in 1903 she decided to create a new women's only group focused solely on voting rights, the Women's Social and Political Union. The WSPU slogan was Deeds, Not Words. In 1905, Pankhurst's daughter Christabel, a fellow member of WSPU and Annie Kenny, went to a meeting to demand if the Liberal Party would support women's suffrage. After a confrontation with the police, both women were arrested. The attention and interest that followed this arrest encouraged Pankhurst to have the WSPU follow a more combative path than other suffrage groups. At first, the WSPU's militancy consisted of buttonholing politicians and holding rallies. Still, following these tactics led members of Pankhurst group to be arrested and imprisoned. Pankhurst herself was first sent behind bars in 1908. The Daily Mail soon dubbed Pankhurst's group of suffragettes, as opposed to the suffragists, who also wanted women to be able to vote in the United Kingdom, but followed less controversial and confrontational channels. Over the next few years, Pankhurst would encourage WSPU members to rein in their demonstrations when it seemed possible that a bill on women's suffrage might move forward. But when the group was disappointed, as in 1910 and 1911, when conciliation bills that included women's suffrage failed to advance, protests would escalate. By 1913, militant actions by the WSPU members included window breaking, vandalising of public art and also arson. She stated, we were called militant and we were quite willing to accept the name. We were determined to press this question of the enfranchisement of women to the point where we were no longer to be ignored by the politicians. Throughout these protests, suffragettes were arrested, but in 1909, the women had begun to engage in hunger strikes while in prison. Though this resulted in violent force feeding, the hunger strikes also led to the early release for many suffragettes. When Pankhurst was given a nine month sentence in 1912 for throwing a rock at the prime minister's residence, she too embarked on a hunger strike. Spared from being forcibly fed, she was soon freed. Seeking to circumvent the hunger strikes, in 1913, the Prisoners' Temporary Discharge for Ill Health Act was enacted. The law said that prisoners who were released for ill health reasons could be rearrested and taken back to prison once they'd recovered. It became known as the Cat and Mouse Act, with the suffragette being the mice pursued by the authorities. We shall fight against the condition of affairs so long as there is life is in us, was quoted. In 1913, after an incendiary device went off in an unoccupied house being built for the Chancellor of the Exchequer, David Lloyd George, Pankhurst received a sentence of three years of penal servitude for inciting the crime. She was released after a hunger strike, but the Cat and Mouse Act led to a series of re-arrests and releases. During one furlough, Pankhurst proceeded to the United States for a fundraising campaign and lecture tour. That continued into 1914. But everything changed with the arrival of the Great War, known as World War I. In 1903, Emmeline Pankhurst founded the Women's Social and Political Union, which used militant tactics to agitate for women's suffrage. Pankhurst was imprisoned many times, but supported the war effort after World War I broke out. Parliament granted women limited suffrage in 1918. 
With the outbreak of World War I in 1914, she and Christabel called off the suffrage campaign and the government released all suffragist prisoners. During the war, Pankhurst, who had previously made three tours of the United States to lecture on women's suffrage, visited the United States, Canada and Russia to encourage the industrial mobilisation of women. She lived in the United States, Canada and Bermuda for several years after the war. In 1926, upon returning to England, she was chosen as a Conservative candidate for East London constituency, but her health failed before she could be elected. The First World War started on the 28th of July 1914 and ended 11th of November 1918. Known as one of the most grim periods of history, there were 20 million deaths and 21 million wounded. The total number of deaths include 9.7 million military personnel and about 10 million civilians. Over 30 nations declared war between 1914 and 1918. The majority joined on the side of the Allies, including Serbia, Russia, France, Britain, Italy and the United States. They are opposed by Germany, Hungary, Austria, Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire, who formed the Central Powers. Through all their good intentions, there was a darker period in the history of the suffragettes, the White Feather Campaign. Can at least admire the suffragettes for their dedication to the country and its causes. Their stopping of their campaign during the war period was admirable. But there were many men that were forced to try and go to the front lines. There were people that conscientious objectors there were also people that were key workers that couldn't go to the front line and also those that suffered medical conditions. The white feather campaign was a shameful part of history. Handing a white feather to signify the person being a coward, in public usually, to humiliate them. Many suffragettes did this in support of the war effort, but it was deemed as something very sad on reflection. Admirably, individual suffragettes did make apologies for their actions and participation in the White Feather campaign. Sadly, as an organisation on a whole, we seem to find no apology. But given how the situations arose and their intentions overall, we can't hold them responsible because they're only doing what was fine and right and expected of the time. But we must remember those poor men, those poor souls that died on foreign fields with nothing but muddy fields and a memory to leave behind. Representation of the People Act of 1928 establishing voting equality for men and women was passed a few weeks after her death. Pankhurst's autobiography, My Own Story, appeared in 1914. One casualty of the movement that is most notable. The suffragette who was remembered by many for a tragic passing by throwing herself under or across the King's Racehorse was called Emily Davison. The incident occurred on June the 4th, 1913, during the Epsom Derby, one of the most prestigious horse races in England. I know this place as it was the spot near where I used to live as a youngster, on Tattenham Corner, where my family are still currently based. They still reside there and still remember this as part of history happening for many years before. On that fateful day at the Epsom Derby, Emily stepped onto the racetrack and attempted to grab hold of the bridle of the king's horse, Amna. In doing so, she was struck by the horse and suffered severe injuries. Despite receiving medical attention, Emily Davison succumbed to her injuries four days later and sadly passed away. Emily Davison's actions at the Derby were seen as a desperate and dramatic protest for women's suffrage. But contrary to the speculation, it wasn't meant to end in tragedy as it sadly and ultimately did. Her death sparked both controversy and sympathy, drawing attention to the suffrage movement and the sacrifices made by its members in their fight for equality. While the exact intentions behind Emily Davison's actions remain a subject of debate, her legacy endures as a symbol of courage, dedication and sacrifice in the pursuit of social justice and women's rights. 
Emmeline Pankhurst sadly passed away on the 14th of June 1928. The cemetery consecrated by Charles James Blomfield, Bishop of London at the time, in June of 1814. It was one of Britain's oldest and most distinguished garden cemeteries. As we go back to her children, Christabel Pankhurst was the eldest daughter of Emmeline Pankhurst. She was a prominent suffragette leader alongside her mother and sister Sylvia. Christabel was known for her fiery militant tactics in the suffragette movement, including acts of civil disobedience and hunger strikes. She played a significant role in the campaign for women's rights and voting within the UK. Let's take a brief rest to have a look at the facilities here at the Pankhurst Centre in Manchester. The house is where she used to live. It just gives it a degree of poignancy that coincides with my documentary. As we know, I like to feature the footage of places that actually were part of people's lives. I entered this premises and there was a feeling of period, a feeling of connection between what I was doing and the person that it was about. It gave me the personal opportunity to be able to do something that really resonated and gave a very special feeling. I was thrilled at this chance. Now entering this room and spending a few hours on my own doing the recording. I'm not the most spiritual person, but I almost felt like there was someone with me. It was a feeling of contentment, a feeling of history. Some of the most enduring feats of strength and endurance came from this house. A woman that legacy lives on in the minds of so many. The piano in the room was an actual family instrument. It went abroad with them and then went to Scotland for some strange reason until the house acquired it back. Also the cabinet, as you see, was something that was sold within the family shop. There are still artifacts here directly related to the Pankhursts. This house is open every Thursday and Sunday from 11 till 4 p.m. Last entry at three. Tickets are available to book up to four weeks in advance. I will drop a link in the description of the website. Do take a look, well worth the trip. One great fact that I was informed of by the manager of the center that Emmeline Pankhurst associated with William Morris. Anyone that knows about Victorian history, William Morris was one of the greatest visual designers and activists of his generation. I have a feature coming on him very, very soon. Admirable that the Pankhurst Trust brings together Manchester Women's Aid and the Pankhurst Centre. They work together to ensure the powerful story of the women who won the right to vote continues to inspire everyone. They continue to challenge gender inequality where it may exist. They also ensure that those suffering from domestic violence and abuse get the confidential help they need. I recently completed a biographical on behalf of someone. It didn't take me a very long time because they had a lot of the research. I just had to film it and put it together. I asked them to give my fee of around £150 to this centre on my behalf. If you can, I would urge anyone to donate to this worthwhile cause. So why not help and be part of making a future based on history? If you can, no matter how small, do consider donating. These wonderful volunteers do so much good within the local community and beyond. The March of the Women, the song of the organisation. If you happen to be a very good female singer, or a choir maybe, that has a great deal of enthusiasm and can inject it into a song, I have it in good authority, they wouldn't mind a version of it recorded. Nudge, nudge. I admit I'm tempted to try it myself, but I don't have the right utilities. Wouldn't really work more poignant from a female perspective.
William Morris, just so you know, design there. We finish now on the last part of the segment. Sylvia Pankhurst was another daughter of Emmeline. She was very active in the suffragette movement. However, she did have differences with her mother and sister Christabel over the direction and tactics of the movement as a whole. Sylvia focused more on socialist and internationalist causes, including workers' rights, anti-colonialism and anti-fascism. She later became known for her active support of Ethiopian independence and her efforts against fascism during the Spanish Civil War. This one is the black sheep, definitely, Adela Pankhurst. She was the third daughter of Emmeline and also participated in suffragette activities. I learned a little bit more today about Nazi sympathising and God knows what, which was a big shock I didn't even come past. But she later moved in her life to Australia, where she became involved in socialist and labour movements. Adela's political beliefs diverged quite a lot from her family's and she was estranged from them for many years. Only recent history did they know after a family tree expose that she was part of it. So Emmeline Pankhurst, two sons, Francis, also known as Frank, was Emmeline Pankhurst's eldest child, her first son. He was born in 1884. He was less involved in the suffragette movement compared to his sisters. Frank pursued a career as an architect and later served in the British Army during World War I. Admiration for that. Henry Francis Pankhurst, often referred to as Harry, was Emmeline's second son. He was born in 1888. Like his brother Frank, was not very active in the movement, as his sisters were. Harry pursued a career in business. So let's go back. What did all this achieve, and where did it really ultimately come from? Well, women were excluded from voting in ancient Greece and the Republic of Rome, as well as in a few democracies that had emerged in Europe by the end of the 18th century. When the franchise was widened, as it was in the United Kingdom in 1832, women continued to be denied all voting rights. The question of women's voting rights finally became an issue in the 19th century, and the struggle was particularly intense here in Great Britain and the United States. But for those countries, they were not the first to grant women the right to vote, at least not on a national basis. By the early years of the 20th century, Women had won the right to vote in national elections in New Zealand, 1893, Australia in 1902, Finland, 1906, and Norway in 1913. In Sweden and the United States, they had voting rights in some local elections. The tragedy of the Great War and its aftermath speeded up the enfranchisement of women in countries of Europe and elsewhere. In the period of 1914 to 39, women in 28 additional countries acquired either equal voting rights with men or the right to vote in the national elections. Those countries included, and this is a big list, Soviet Russia in 1917, Canada, Germany, Austria and Poland in 1918, Czechoslovakia in 1919, the United States of Hungary in 1920, Great Britain in 1918 and 28, Burma, Myanmar, 22, Ecuador in 1929, South Africa in 1930, Brazil and Uruguay and Thailand in 1932, Turkey and Cuba, 34, and the Philippines in 1937. A number of those countries, women were initially granted the right to vote in municipal or other elections, or perhaps provincial elections. Only later were they granted the right to vote in national elections. Immediately after World War II, France, Italy, Romania, Yugoslavia and China were added to this group. Full suffrage for women was introduced in India by the Constitution in 1949. In Pakistan, women received full voting rights in national elections in 1956. In another decade, the total number of countries that had given women the right to vote reached more than 100. Partly because nearly all countries that gained independence after World War II guaranteed equal voting rights to men and women in their constitutions. Moving forward, 1971, Switzerland allowed women to vote in federal and most cantonal elections. In 73, women were granted full voting rights in Syria. The United Nations Convention on Political Rights of Women, adopted in 1952, provides that women shall be entitled to vote in all elections on equal terms with men without any discrimination. Finally, a quick excerpt of a song that was able to perform on the premises, in the home of somebody that very well would have known it. It could have played here. Sometimes 
when I feel bad and things are blue. I wish a girl I had, say one like you, someone within my heart to build a throne, someone who'd never part to call my own. If you were the only girl in the world, and I were the only boy, Nothing else would matter in this world today. We could go on loving in the same old way. A garden of Eden just made for two, where nothing can mar our joy. I would say such wonderful things to you. There would be such wonderful things to do If you were the only girl in the world And I were the only boy I Don't get down here often Please mind the gap I felt for this documentary I couldn't finish on any other way than this. This is Brompton Cemetery. It's since 1852 the first London cemetery to be crown property, managed by Royal Parks in West Brompton in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. It is one of the magnificent seven cemeteries established by an Act of Parliament and laid out in 1839. It opened in 1840. Grade 1 listed, this cemetery has over 200,000 people laid to rest here. Among its notable people is Dr John Snow who proved that cholera was spread by infected water. An amazing man. With its own cafe and stunning grounds, I would recommend anyone in the area to stop by and have a nice walk around. As you go into the cemetery, not far up on the left, you reach this landmark. Simple, effective, but poignant. Still with reminders of this fantastic woman's heritage, adorned on the grave. If you want to learn about your future, just look into the past. I leave you now with some short words that I hope will reflect positively in your lives. Standing before the solemn grave of Emmeline Pankhurst, I was overcome with a profound sense of reverence and gratitude. Here lied a woman whose courage, determination and unwavering conviction changed the course of history, not just for women in Britain, but for generations to come. As I gazed upon the simple stone marker, a reminder came across me of the sacrifices made by those who came before us, who fought tirelessly for the rights and freedoms we often take granted today. Emmeline Pankhurst was a trailblazer, a visionary whose fearless leadership paved the way for women to claim their rightful place in society. But her legacy extends far beyond the suffragette movement. It is a testament to the power of ordinary individuals to effect extraordinary change, to challenge injustice, inequality, wherever it may be found. Emmeline Pankhurst's legacy reminds us that no dream is too big, no obstacle too daunting, and when we have the courage to stand up for what is right, we can achieve anything. As I stand here in this cemetery, surrounded by the echoes of history, I'm filled with a renewed sense of purpose and determination. 
Emmeline Pankhurst's grave is not just a final resting place. It's a symbol of hope, resilience, and the enduring power of the human spirit. May we honor her memory, not just with words, but with actions, by continuing the fight for equality and justice in all its forms, by lifting up the voices of those who have been silenced, and by never losing sight of the vision of a world where every individual is treated with dignity and respect. As I bid farewell to this sacred space, I carry with me the spirit of Emily, a beacon of inspiration that will guide me on my journey forward. Thank you, Emily, for your courage, sacrifice, and your unwavering commitment to a better world. Your legacy lives on in each of us as we strive to build a future worthy of your dreams. This was one documentary I was very excited to make for a very long time. It's a standout moment in history. So many people gave so much, so I'd like to thank the Pankhurst Center for their cooperation and collaboration in me achieving this great film. Nothing more poignant than being able to make this film in the actual place this wonderful lady lived. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Never surrender, never give up the fight. The Legacy of Emmeline Pankhurst